on the mic. There we go. Thank you, Amy. Um, So the first slide I have this morning is about prayer. So it says, the prayer of the righteous, not perfect, is powerful and effective. So I want to encourage you not to give up on prayer. Even little prayers. I don't know if you're like me sometimes. It's like, why, why bother? Why should I pray? You know, it doesn't seem like it's worth it. Anyone ever have those feelings from time to time? Let me read James 5, 16. James is writing, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And here's the second part. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. So for me, this text points to a little bit of what righteous means. Notice this confession piece. It says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. And then it talks about the prayer of the righteous. I believe a person who is open and honest before God, before others, a person who's confessed, that's a righteous person. That's us. That's a lot of us. And our prayers are effective. And in the message, this James 5, 16 text reads, prayers and praying, excuse me, the prayer of a person living right with God is powerful and effective. Not perfect. Can a brother get an amen? If you're thinking perfect... You're in trouble. We all are. But think honest, open, vulnerable before God and keep praying. Church, I want to thank you for the many ways you are supporting God's kingdom through Heston Mennonite Church and and many of you beyond Heston Mennonite. Sunday schools, governance board, ministry teams, JYF, Shine, MYF, areas of finance, music. Many of us are involved in a lot of ways. Amen? Thank you. Thank you for staying with it. So for greeting time this morning, I invite you to stand. And as you, as you greet people with a wave, maybe mouth or say, Thank you. Another way that you give is by being in attendance. You're here. You're present. We can diminish the importance of being present until no one shows up, until no one's listening. Amen? So I invite us to stand and greet each other this morning with a thank you. Thank you. Thank you, church. It's nice. There's a few people smiling that weren't before, right? It's good. It's good. So obviously we're talking about peace today, and the next slide points to to it. Peace, or the Hebrew word for peace, or it's used, is shalom. Church, it refers to many things that make make for the person the highest good. For a person's highest good. So, I took a picture of my thumb. Right underneath my thumb, that's the Hebrew word shalom. Wanted you to see that in a slightly blurred state. And shalom means health. It's a fullness. Welfare, good condition, success, comfort, peace, salvation. It's a whole thing. So in talking about peace, I'm going to bring a shalom definition this morning. Church, 
Peace is not just an absence of war or conflict. Neither is it just an inner solace either. But it's a combination of a lot of things. So I brought my John Drescher Spirit Fruit book back, and I like what he says about peace. He writes, Shalom or peace is not simply the absence of having war or trouble. It is prayer, it is a prayer and hope that all is well. It not merely refrains from speaking evil, but speaks good. Shalom reflects a relationship of concern and care between two persons, two nations, between God and God's people. He also writes, we find the New Testament a book of peace. It mentions peace, some of you are numbers people, you like this, 88 times. And it occurs in each New Testament book. And then Drescher writes here, the New Testament word has much the same meaning as shalom in the Old Testament. I like that. And here you can see the Hebrew word. And maybe, maybe some of you see that Hebrew word up there and you're thinking, hmm, I'm going to study Hebrew someday. There's a few people here that have studied some Hebrew. So they get that. You never know putting that out there. So who doesn't want peace or shalom in their lives, right? Right? So what interest do you have in increasing your peace? Even during these COVID times, it has a way of wrecking our peace. Hmm? So I have an idea here. I think... Actually wanting to have an increase in peace or shalom in your life, I think that's an important first action. Do you want it? Do you want some peace? How bad do you want it? Because church, it takes some effort. To obtain peace is not a passive thing. It's not just breathing, but breathing can help you get there. But even breathing is not passive, right? Just like I told you a couple weeks ago, patience, the, the accumulation of patience is not a passive thing. There's action. There's things that you need to pay attention to. So if you want peace, if you want it, you got to go after it. With some intensity, how bad do you want it? So maybe some of you have heard this saying. The pain of staying the same, the pain of staying the same has to be greater than the pain of change. If the change is going to happen. Because some of us are fine with what is. I got enough peace. So you're okay with it. But if you realize, what I have is not enough, I want some more, but it's going to take a little bit of pain to change. You've got to face that. Wanting and needing more peace in your life and the effort it takes has to be more important than just what you're doing right now, or you won't really work at it that much. So the next slide I have this morning. So look at that hiking path. See the path? It's going to take a little effort to find that path. You agree with me? Okay, just, just check in here. I believe we can have increased peace and shalom in our lives, but it's going to take some effort. And I'm talking about peace with God. Peace with self, peace with others, and I liked how Amy named in the beginning, also peace with nature in the natural world. But it's going to take some effort, and how bad are you willing to work at it? So on this idea of taking effort, 
I remember years ago when Marie was in high school, and she found this, this uh, music situation, a uh, high-quality summer music program near Chicago at Northwestern University. And at that time, <laughs> it was way out of our budget, and I don't know what was going to happen. And, and we were still trying to figure out at that time, believe it or not, does this vocal music Marie's thing, you know, is she any good at it? How hard is she going to work at it? Well, so she brought this uh, several thousand dollar music um, summer program to us. And, and I, her mom and I, one of the first things we would do is we're trying to test how bad she wants it. Because to me, that's a big thing. If you really want it, you're going to put some effort into it. So one of the ways we parented at that point was we said, well, we'll pay half. So we couldn't pay the whole thing, and even paying half was going to be a stretch at that point. Because to be honest with you, I thought she was going to cave and go, oh, well, I'm not going to do it. Because, you know, sometimes that happens in families, right? Well, you pay half, and ah, I don't really want to do it. You know what Marie did? She got a job at McDonald's. How many people work at McDonald's to get money for a music program to learn opera? <laughs> Right? But that's what she did. She got her share of the money. Her mom and I were able to find the other half, and, and you know, the story continues, right? But the question was how hard was she willing to work at it? How hard are we willing to work at an increased peace? So, a couple of verses I want to read about peace. Both Danae and Kay have referred to one that I won't read again John 14, 27. Powerful, strong. Uh, passages about peace. Here's one that I just want to share briefly. Isaiah 9, 6. We would have heard this around Christmas. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and here's the, the, the last one, Prince of Prince of Shalom. And that Prince of Shalom, Jesus, is the one who said, I give you peace. Not as the world gives. It's deeper, richer, stronger, more powerful. And then there's a, a beautiful passage in Isaiah 26 that speaks of peace. And, and for me, a way to get peace. The prophet writes, trust in the Lord, in Yahweh, in the Almighty One, in the Creator. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord God you have an everlasting rock. Those of steadfast mind, God keeps in peace, in peace, because they trust in you. I believe seeking, noting, observing, Paying attention, studying the Prince of Peace is an important action to help you gain more peace in your life. It's going to take some effort. For some of us, the act of Bible study, personal Bible study or group, that takes effort, but that can increase your peace. Prayer is something that can increase your peace. That's active. That takes effort. Takes discipline. Perhaps quiet time in nature. Where's your spot? We've heard that this morning. By a pond or a river or a lake or an ocean. But it takes some effort to put yourself in that position. Or here are other ways I believe you could increase your peace. Healthy friendships. But you have to put some effort into those. Or more disciplined thinking. That is another way that you can help increase your peace. We see that in that Isaiah text that I read. In Isaiah 26, the prophet says, Those of steadfast mind... You keep in peace. So there's an aspect, there's a mental aspect of, of staying focused on increasing 
your peace. And in, actual, uh, in today's text that, that Amy read, um, in Philippians, Paul refers to that as well. And I know Paul was uh, intimately familiar with Isaiah and the scriptures there. I think that forms some of what, even what he's writing here to the Philippians. So listen again for how Paul reiterates the importance of prayer, of gratitude, and mind discipline in having peace. So listen for that. So he's writing, he says, first of all, don't worry about anything or everything. But he says, in everything, pray. I think he's saying pray because that helps your peace aspect. Maybe during prayer, you just need to be quiet more. And do the breathing thing. Well, Pastor Jess, I can't pray because I get so distracted about everything. Paul continues and says, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Perhaps naming and writing your thanksgiving. What makes you thankful? It's okay to keep a list. People, it's okay to keep a list. I have one in my Bible at home. And in verse 7, Paul writes, And the peace of God, the shalom of God, which surpasses all in understanding, all intellect. He says, that peace will guard your hearts and what? Minds. There's an aspect of our mind with having peace. Don't ignore that. Then he goes in and says, beloved. And when I read beloved, I'm thinking, ooh, that's me. That's you. You're beloved. You are loved. So Paul's writing, beloved, this is some ways you can have some peace. Think about stuff that's true, that's honorable, that's pure, that's pleasing, that's commendable. Think about these things. Have a steadfast mind. Work on your mental discipline. Amen? Do you see that? That's hard. Because our minds go. My mind does. It's tricky. So I remember a time I just started pastoring, and I had, I had lots of worries. You know, probably one of the big ones was fear of being ineffective, fear of failure. And, and um, so there was a certain church issue at that time I was praying about. I was praying about everything I was doing was praying. I was doing some unhealthy fasting about it, too, I think. And I say unhealthy because I think... Just the absence of eating isn't necessarily healthy fasting. I think you have to have a plan, okay? So I'm praying about this all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm praying manically. And I remember finally after a while, at one point, I think I heard the Spirit whisper to me, Jess, Jess, would you quit bugging me? I heard you the first time. I'm working on it. These things take time. And then I can imagine the Spirit then also adding, and why don't you go to a movie or something? Serious. But the idea was that it was just trying too hard. So there's this balance of putting effort and also relaxing and not just pushing, pushing, and pushing. There's this aspect of a sound mind and good rational thinking that can contribute to our peace. Our personal peace, our peace with self, our peace in our relationship with God, Peace with relationships with others in the community. So next slide I have this morning. So in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, 
And in Luke's version, and it's actually called the Sermon on the Plain, it's in chapter 6, you see the reference there. So I read these, and I noticed some actions that I believe can contribute to peace with God, peace with self, and peace with others. So my invitation this morning, I'll share some of the ones that I want to pull out. It's not going to be all-inclusive. But do you notice them too? What do you see and read there that speaks to you today? So I think public worship is good. I think sermons have an aspect of of helping people think about some things sometimes. But I'll be honest with you. I don't think Sunday morning worship with Sunday school, if you go to Sunday school, or sermons and worship, I don't think that's enough to get maximum spiritual growth. I think you have to read some things for yourself. So that's part of the encouragement. Is reading this, and, and, and some of us need reasons to read, things to look for in the scriptures. And so the prompt that, that I'm challenging you is as you read maybe Matthew 5 through 7, or Luke's version, Sermon on the Plain, what stands out for you that can help you have increased peace with God or increased peace with yourself or incre- increased peace with others? So I start with Matthew 5, 9. Jesus is, is, is talking. Actually, Jesus is preaching. And I love it that Jesus is preaching. Not everybody loves preachers and preaching. But I do. So I love it that Jesus is preaching. He's preaching. Might be sitting down when he's doing it, but he's preaching. And one of the things he says is, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the shalom makers. Bless those who contribute to others to help them have their highest good. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. I love that. Peacemakers can be a lot of things. Amen? So it's interesting. Dresher has a few things to say about peacemaking or peacemakers or shalom makers. He writes, and I agree with him. That's why I'm sharing it out loud with you. Peacemakers must maintain a sincere spirit of humility. A peacemaker is not arrogant or proud. One test of peacemaking is whether we are really peacemakers among those close to us. Woo! Peacemaking is huge on a micro level with those around us. Are you paying attention to that? Dresser goes on, so he, he writes, We may preach loud and long about the warmongers of the state, yet be all the time creating havoc and hatred within our own fellowship and family. Such a spirit negates what we say or do. I remember years ago, there was a person in my congregation who was huge on a macro peacemaking theme. He was huge on anti-military, and it was part of his experience of coming out of the military and so forth. And he says... Pastor Jess, you need to preach on peace more in church. And I said, okay, let let me think about that. It wasn't long before I realized this man was abusing his wife and his children. And in my eyes, his bigger peacemaking thing diminished. And so my challenge in walking with him for a while was, how are you going to take care of this immediate part? He left the church. Another thing that I like that Dresher talks about peacemaking is he says, peacemakers must maintain more a spirit of prayer than of criticism. 
And that's good for home life, right? That's good for community. That's good for peacemaking as historical as Mennonites as we take a stand. I think it's huge that, that we have a spirit of prayer rather than just criticism. He writes, we can easily develop expertise in speaking against national leadership. But of course, we need to have a sense of humility. Lastly, he writes, prayer must be our basic approach rather than just caustic, disrespectful, and derogatory remarks. Our condemnation of leaders can become greater than our concern. Kind of a different view on peacemaking than I've heard a ton of. But to me, it's fuller. We need to guard our hearts and minds with the peace from God that passes understanding, that, that brings love and goodness and generosity, but also then strengthens the witness of when you say something politically or you say something Strong against violence. So, a couple passages from the Sermon on the Mount that I think contribute to peace with God or with others or with ourselves. So, Matthew 6, 33, Jesus is talking. And he says, seek first the kingdom of God. And these things will be added unto you. I think when we seek the Prince of Peace, when we seek God, that will help increase our peace and how we live our lives and how to be better peacemakers. Another passage I find strong, also is in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, 12 reads, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That would help peace with others, right? If we had that attitude in relationships with people. That's also in Luke as well. I love that. And then this next one, it's the next slide. Jesus is talking, Sermon on the, the Mount here in Luke chapter 6, 42. Many of you are familiar with this passage. He says, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Hence, the picture of logs. <laughs> or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? Jesus says, Jesus preaches you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take or maybe not to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. That's peacemaking, right? Attending to your own issues. Attending to yourself. That's going to help with peace in the community. Amen? And you will have more peace for yourself. You're like, oh, whew. I'm not being judgmental. I'm, I'm taking care of myself, my own issues. And a little bit later in Luke 6, Jesus talks about another thing that I think can speak to increased peace in our life. Verse 37, Jesus says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn. And you will not be condemned. And I love this part. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. I think he's talking about forgiveness there. Give, offer forgiveness to others. I think it will be given to you. That will increase your own peace. And then Jesus says, Given it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will Forgiveness be put onto your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. How many of you want more peace in your life? Right? 
Offer it. How many of you want to experience forgiveness? Offer it. But sometimes it's hard. Right, church? We need to call on Jesus for help, the Prince of Peace, to help us in our journey of, of obtaining and offering increased peace. But we need each other as well. We need healthy friendships. We need outlets where we can talk and process and get some healthy feedback. We need places where we know other people are praying for us. That can increase our trust and our hope. So in conclusion, last slide. And, and before I, I talk about this slide, perhaps some of you heard the phrase, hurt people hurt people. You might have heard that one. Yeah. You don't want to be that person. Don't be that guy. And we will be that person unless we ask for help, unless we work at our own stuff. I want to be this. I believe peaceful and peace-filled people bring peace to people. I want to be that. I want to work hard at it. I want us to be those kinds of persons. Those are the kinds of persons that change families, colleges, schools, situations. And I love how Jesus offers that to us in John 20. John 20, it says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, and I believe Jesus says this to you all, peace, shalom, be with you. And then a verse or two later, Jesus says it again, peace, be with you, church. May peace from Jesus.